Yeah, so hello, my name is Boyan, and I'll be I'll be presenting Neon.Tech. It's a one-year-old startup, and our mission is to make Postgres serverless and effortless for everybody while staying open source and providing developer-friendly features like branching and whatnot. I'll get to that in a second. First, I want to get to know the audience. How many people here I identify as app developers or full stack or product folks that are on the user side of a database? Zero. <laughs> Amazing. And how many people know what a right ahead log is? Everybody. OK. <laughs> uh, good. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself well, to give people a chance to come in the next five minutes. And then we'll start, start with the serious uh, content, I guess. So I'm, I'm not a hotshot in the database industry. I'm an engineer with a short but good enough career so far. And my previous experience is working in a financial tech startup. And let me share an anecdote with you about my experience working there. I had a demo that was working on my laptop, and I wanted to just I had an opportunity to present the same day, and I wanted to ship it to production as fast as possible, put it in the hands of people. So I needed to deploy a database, and I was like, how do I do that? I was like fresh out of college, I don't know how to do that. They're like, oh, you send an ops ticket, and then a friendly person from there is going to pick it up. It's going to arrange that for you tomorrow. They're going to provision an instance for you, hopefully the correct size. Hopefully they're going to give you the right permissions, and then you'll use it and feel guilty about using it for just this little small demo that you have. So. Uh, then later they will bother you to probably kill that instance for you. And I was like, sure, I'll do that. I won't meet my deadline for the presentation. Uh, and But, you know, fine, it's good enough. So that day I started wondering, why is it so easy to spin up like a Google Sheets instance? But uh, And Postgres has been around for 50 years. But if someone wants to start uh, using Postgres, they can't just go to postgres.com. And you know, like spin up uh, Postgres, uh, a production ready free instance of Postgres they can play around with uh, and that they can share with other people. So, just a quick question how many of you think that an uh, engineer fresh out of college will, would be capable of uh, provisioning this kind of instance from the, for themselves with 20 minutes of work? Uh, they've never used AWS before, they haven't used anything before. They're like, OK, is your hands raised? How many? <laughs> yeah, your laptop, but you want to share your application so that people click on it and like, they experience the app, right? Uh, or you want to integrate with another service. But anyway, how many of you think that they can do that in two seconds? <laughs> so probably also zero. I was expecting some hands to the 20 minute uh, question. Um, but anyway, you're all lucky because today I'll show you how to do this in two seconds. Uh, I mean, you won't find it useful, but the developers you work with, maybe, <laughs> and the people watching remotely. Um, let me say a little bit about the, um, our team and the company, because as I said, I'm not a hotshot in the database space, but these people are. Already a few folks uh, told me yesterday, say hi to Keiki for me, so apparently people know him. <laughs> so um, the company was founded last March. It's one year old. I've been there for six months. Nikita, the CEO, working from the USA, he's the ex-founder of Single Store and MemSQL. Uh, Stas comes from Yandex. He's a Postgres contributor, the service systems expert. And uh, Heike comes from VMware. He's a key Postgres committer. So just on this slide, I want to note that um, here you can see that we're hiring actually from the Postgres community, and as opposed to uh, the traditional way people build databases, where they build something performant, uh, and after afterwards they latch on, you know, Postgres compatibility. We're going about this the other way. We're starting from vanilla Postgres. We we ask the question, uh, what should we do to make this uh, cloud native, and uh, and then we add those bits to Postgres, contribute back to uh, Postgres itself, and keep all of our code open source so that we can actually engage with the Postgres community. Uh, so but that doesn't mean we're just yet running Postgres in a bunch of uh, kube uh, pods. We have like 80,000 lines of Rust code just for a storage layer. And we have an architecture that separates storage from 
compute. And we've built all of that in the last year, and I want to thank the Rust language for making this so easy. <laughs> uh, and I'll get into that in a second. Exactly five minute mark, all right. So in this talk, I will show you a quick demo of what Neon is, tell you how it's made, and give you some access codes so that you can try it, you can share it with your friends. Does that sound good? All righty. So, Neon is cloud native Postgres. You guys know what that means. Maybe if someone's listening remotely, they don't. So I'm going to show everyone. I'm going to create a new project, start your timers. Uh, okay, I don't need onboarding. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to go to SQL editor, select one, run, and I get one. Yay, where's my applause? There you go. <laughs> database in, uh, how to start a database in one second. Um, so this is like the most basic bare bones offering that uh, we have. Uh, so for the rest of the presentation, of course, I'm gonna dig into the, the, the other features. So let me go back to the dashboard to show you that there's another way to connect to this. I can just copy this command over here, go in my terminal and use psql to connect and, and I have a psql connection to the same instance I just created. Uh, and this would work with dbvar or any SQL client that you're using or any other integration you're using. Uh, anyway, so what is so special about Neon? First, the first hint is this indicator over here that says that compute is active and accepts connections, right? Uh, so when does it become inactive, like, uh, and what happens then? I'll go back to my dashboard to show you that I have two projects, the one I just created that's active, and another one that's idle. And this one is idle because I haven't used it in the last five minutes, so it went to sleep. So there are zero Postgres uh, compute nodes uh, running. This, this project is consuming zero resources. So you as the developer is not paying anything, and we as the company are not paying anything. Um, uh, so now I'm going to show you a little bit about this is all I have for the demo for now. For the other features, I'm just going to talk about them. Uh, to, to summarize, we know that in Neon, we know that everybody loves Postgres. Our mission is to make you more productive with it. And we've built a lot of features on top uh, of Postgres. And uh, we, we've built a new architecture in order to deliver on these features. I want to show you the architecture first, and then I'll show you how that architecture supports these, uh, support these features, features like branches, point in time recovery, time travel queries, and whatnot. All right, section two. Uh, let's talk about the architecture. I want to tell you what separation of storage and compute is. If you don't already know, uh, it's inspired by Aurora, but it's not exactly the same thing. And then I'm going to show you uh, what that allows us to do. So in a traditional Postgres installation, how does it work? You buy a server. The server has a local disk. And you put Postgres on it, and you run it. And Postgres uses the local disk, and you're done. So it's pretty simple, except you need to buy the server and spend money. Uh, and we're a developer-focused uh, company, and we recognize that's already a uh, burden, right? Uh, and eventually, when you outgrowth this one Postgres instance, you need to uh, you need to have a replica for availability. You need to back up the cloud storage. You need to test your backups. Blah blah. blah and it becomes this complicated project. And of course, there's many other ways to do it with other cloud services. Um, so how is Neon different? What do we actually do? So on the left side, we have what we call compute, just the Postgres binary, the actual Postgres binary, not, our, not something we implemented. It's running in a, without disk. Actually, it has disk, but that disk is not persistent. It's just being used as a cache. Uh, and when this Postgres uh, instance wants to use its disk instead, it just goes to the Neon storage system, which is backed by cloud storage, uh, like Amazon S3 or Microsoft or whatever else. All right, so let me zoom into this Neon storage system to show you what's inside. 
should be in a slideshow. There we go. <laughs> so uh, inside the Neon storage system, we have safekeepers and page servers. The job of the safekeeper is to just accept the wall from the Postgres uh, binary as fast as possible and store it durably in, in this consensus cluster. And then this wall gets sent to the page server. And the page server buffers it in memory because uh, it's allowed to do that because the safekeeper is already keeping it safe. Uh, so the page server buffers this wall into memory and then eventually flashes it to disk and reorganizes it into efficient data structure. And the goal of this data structure is to make it easy to answer the get page queries and to also store this data structure eventually into cold storage, Amazon S3 or similar, uh, and be able to later retrieve that uh, from cold storage for fast recovery of this page server itself. Um, all right, and let's uh, let's take a minute to note that the queries that Postgres is making on this page server have the form of get page x at time t. So it's not get the latest page, which you Postgres would do from disk, right? Like you can only access the latest page. It's any page at any time, recent time. Uh, so this makes the job of the page server a little bit more difficult, but it allows us to implement cool features like this. If we want uh, time travel queries, and a time travel query is just, uh, if you wanna see what the database looked like last week, so you wanna query last week's database, just spin up a new compute node that asks the page server about last week instead of latest pages, and that's pretty trivial to set up. Anyway, as I mentioned, that makes the job of the page server a little bit more complicated, so naturally I'm gonna zoom in to show you what we did there. If we squint real hard and oversimplify, uh, the storage format on the page server looks something like this. The boxes are files, and we have RAM over here. Uh, so you can think of it as a chain of commits or a timeline where you start with the base image. You're keeping some wall in RAM. When RAM fills up, you flush that wall into what we call a delta layer. Or sometimes you take a snapshot and you record a little bit more information except for just a raw wall. Maybe you take images of some pages, maybe you, uh, or something else. I don't wanna get into that, that's an entire topic. If there are database nerds and data structure nerds in the audience, like we have time for questions, we can dive into more details. And there's another complication that I'm omitting here, which is that we also checkpoint this similarly to how an LSM tree would checkpoint uh, uh, its uh, files in order to make them more queryable. I'm not gonna go into detail for now. Anyway, we have this basic timeline of immutable files. Why do we do that? Well, reason number one is when the page server flashes a file to disk, then you can just schedule that file for upload to S3, and when that upload is finished, you can say, it can go to the safekeeper, which was keeping our wall uh, safe, and you can tell it, you can garbage collect that, it's in cold storage. Uh, so that's reason number one. And reason number two is branching. Uh, I mean, you all know GitHub branches, right? The branch is just a, an entire copy of your repository that you can independently modify. But we're not copying anything here because like this entire system is copy on write. We're just creating an another timeline that shares some history with the, with the previous timeline. So when we wanna make a branch, we just uh, start a new timeline and base it off of an existing layer file, uh, which doesn't involve any copying. So you can have a five terabyte database and create 5,000 branches on it and uh, that will survive. That means you can have, maybe you can have a production database that five people have access to but all your interests have access to create branches from that production database and mess with it, right? Uh, I haven't even fully explored what's, what people will want to do with these branches and that's where we need your feedback. This is, as I said, we're a one year old uh, startup and we're in the research and development uh, stage. We're uh, trying out a lot of things. We want to see what people actually like, right? 
So to summarize so far, on the features front, so far we have bottomless storage, which means uh, uh, the amount of storage you have to your database is not limited by uh, the size of EC2 instance or the maximum size, of, uh, the size of the biggest EC2 instance uh, that you can get because storage goes to our storage nodes which are completely separate from compute. We scale down to zero. As I said, you're not paying when you're not using it. We don't scale up yet, but that's in the works. We have full compatibility with Postgres. And full means we use the binary, as I said before. Uh, we're open source. Uh, transitioning from Postgres to Neon is going to be predictable. All of your uh, code is going to work. You're not going to have to change it. And if you're using any extensions, the ex extensions are going to work. Unless it's a cron job extension that needs the <laughs> compute node to be alive, of course. Uh, and we have some features in the works as it had branches. Uh, works on my laptop. I don't want to demo it today. Uh, we have time travel queries where you can just query the database as it existed at some other point in time. Point in time recovery with a second or so uh, resolution. Uh, and we're working on a lot of third party integrations. And this is important because. We are open source, developer friendly, and multi-cloud. That means if for another startup, uh, it's it's much easier for us to collaborate with our with other startups who are uh, innovating in the cloud space, uh, and provide an entire ecosystem of cloud apps you can use that are all uh, multi-cloud. I guess. Uh, for an example, there was a startup where that allows you to. When you, if you're doing some data science and you have some Python function that's running too slow, you just stick a decorator in it and say, oh, I want this to run in the cloud, and then it works a thousand times faster. And it's used by data scientists, but at some point you need a database, and you just connect to Neon, get a connection string, put it in there. I'm sure the data scientist will use this database twice and forget about it, and we don't want him to get charged, right? So this is the kind of integrations we're thinking about, and a lot more that I'm not aware of. Um, have a question? Binary, how do you scale down to zero compute? Oh yeah, great question. Like in the demo earlier, I connected with PSQL, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens if PSQL tries to connect and there's nothing running there? Uh, so there's actually a proxy uh, in front of the compute node, and all this proxy does is does authentication and all stuff like that. And then once it establishes a connection with the client, it just uh, forwards the traffic directly to the compute node. So while this authentication is happening, this compute node has time to spin up. Um, does that answer your question? Looking at actual numbers, how soon it will spin up? Because it has to spin up, it has to warm up the cache, and uh, how does Yes. Uh, well, as I said, we're focused on developer experience, and uh, there's a lot of performance we can do that is just a matter of programming. Right now, I expect startup to take a second. So this one is idle, right? So I expect startup to take about a second because we're not even pulling uh, the, oh, there we go, it returned one. I need to refresh to actually see the new status. Yeah, so what happened there we, is we actually spun up a new uh, kube uh, pod to, to host this compute node. But very trivially, we can just like have a pool of those uh, Postgres nodes ready to go. And as I said, the cache needs to be pre-warmed, and that's another thing we need to optimize at some point. So, the, so there is a standby pool, except you are not you paying for it, the infrastructure is paying for it. Yeah, because it's just fixed size, right? We can grow a number of users, but the pool can just have five nodes in it. Um, Yeah, and there's a couple of features we're thinking about. I mean, we're just talking about them. They're not in development. Uh, I want to mention one of them, which is in index suggestion AI. Because we have branches, you know, we can like take a branch from uh, the production database, uh, try some indexes on it, 
and run the same queries that we run in production, see if it's faster, and if it is faster, tell the client, hey, uh, would you like to add this index? It seems to make this thing faster. I'm not an AI person, so <laughs> I'm gonna stop myself here. Uh, a couple of other things, edge reader and edge writer nodes, like as many read replicas as you want. Uh, those read replicas would just connect to the page server directly without uh, adding any extra load on the primary writer node. And so far, we only have one writer computer all the time. And the consensus cluster uh, makes sure that we don't have more than one. We avoid the split brain problem. Uh, but of course, if you want local writes, uh, you want edge writer nodes at some point. And we have a project in development here. We're collaborating with Ting, University of Maryland, but I don't want to get it wrong. I don't know everything about this company. <laughs> so we have a plan for that. That is too early to talk about it, maybe. And there's other things we'll explore, of course. So yeah, I want to stop right here and give you a second to pull out your phones and go to this tiny URL. Uh, and let us know a bit about your thoughts. Like, what would you do with Nirn if you had it? Or, or what would you do with Nirn's architecture that, uh, what do you think is uniquely possible with this kind of architecture that wasn't previously? And to give you a couple of examples, uh, like imagine you're a developer and you're just making some kind of app. You open a pull request that contains a database migration. And the uh, pull request gets accepted, merged into main, uh, deployed to dev stage, and then gets deployed to prod and breaks everything. And why did it break everything? Well, because the migration was compatible with your schema, but not with the data that was on prod. So maybe you had like some null entries and you try to add a non-null uh, constraint and that breaks everything. And when you're a developer and you want to iterate quickly, all you care about is tight feedback loops. So if you could have known when you open the PR that you're going to break something, you should have known and so that you know to either clean up pro your production database or uh, reconsider that migration, right? So that's one example that something you can do with these branches. Test your schema migrations in CI. Another example is testing query performance on a branch of prod. Like, um, has anyone had the experience where you have a query that runs maybe five hours in prod and it's breaking your services? And then you want to optimize it, and what are your choices? You can uh, use a smaller version of the database on your laptop and iterate with different versions of that query until you find something fast, but of course that's not gonna get you anywhere because like on a smaller database you're gonna have different statistics, different query plan, you're basically, uh, it's an uphill battle. Or maybe you can test directly against prod, but maybe you don't have permissions because does everyone in the company have permissions to fiddle with prod, especially with write queries? Uh, but something you can do is just spin up a branch from prod and go crazy with that branch and then spin it down. Uh, question. So yeah. if a developer is accessing production, yeah. how do you secure the data so they're not looking at customer data? Yeah, well, whether they have read access or write access to this database are two different questions. So maybe they only have clone access, right? Uh, uh, a developer can have the permission to clone this repository without, the per without having the permission to right to it, right? You're trying to prevent them from breaking stuff without people so noticing. You're trying to prevent them from reading uh, confidential customer data that they're not supposed to be seeing. Oh yeah, then you don't give them access. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, another idea is you can stream database changes to your web app, maybe. As I said, our architecture is all based around uh, these streams of write ahead log, and currently those are physical replication streams. But we can very easily open a logical replication stream, put it in the Debezium, then take it to materialize, or, or maybe directly to your React app. I don't know. This is what we want feedback on. 
um, let us know, fill out the survey. Also, as I said, we have a lot of Postgres hackers. I'm not one of them. Uh, so if you have anything that's, any Postgres improvements you'd like to see that are in our domain, and our domain is taking Postgres to the cloud, right? Uh, so the Postgres buffer cache or whatnot, those are things that we're gonna be messing with uh, very soon. If you'd like us to um, fix any Postgres issues that uh, that you find frustrating, we can promise anything, but please let us know. And I invite you all to try Neon. We're launching very soon. The website is neon.tech. You can just go to the website, sign in, and use the Percona Live invite code. You will get 10 gigabytes of free storage and some cheap compute. Uh, and be aware that we haven't launched yet, so this is pre-launch, I guess, developer preview. Uh, start us on GitHub. Um, we open source everything, including the, so how many stars do we have? 273 so far. We open source everything, including the storage layer, the architecture, the cloud deployment, uh, performance data, the website itself, everything's open source. Follow us on Twitter and apply for jobs. We're hiring many kinds of jobs, like developer relations, customer support, uh, SREs, systems engineers, uh, technical writers, a lot of stuff. And DM me on Twitter if you want, if you have questions or if you want to catch me tomorrow and grab a beer. Question, yeah? Yeah. Your time travel pitch is very interesting. Uh, but I have a first of all a question. Did you estimate a space overhead you will need, for example, to go one or two days uh, in the past? Because there could be a huge amount of uh, page words for this, especially, for example, if it's, if it's a metadata page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question was, uh, could we consider the space overhead of supporting time travel queries, especially when they're a little bit older in the past, right? Yes. Yeah, so if we go back to the architecture diagram, so this page server is mostly responsible for, if the data is fresh, if it's from the last day, the page server is gonna have an easy time working with it because uh, that's already part of its job. If it's a little bit older, we have a couple of options. We can uh, spin up a new page server that's gonna. So yeah, to summarize, we have yeah we have the option to take that space overhead in order to provide better performance, or uh, yeah, actually we have to whenever you whenever you want to query something that's too far in the past, we have to take some space overhead. Uh, Uh, what metadata page? Everything? I don't know, like the space. Oh, I see, like there's some single page that's getting some like very yeah, heavy traffic. Single page that gets a lot of updates, several updates per second. Uh, okay. So then you are going to store every version of this page on disk? Oh yeah, great question. Well, let's come back to this, right? And dive into more details, so we have time. Um, so this is the oversimplified version of what's going on. So. Here I have this snapshot. Uh, I have this snapshot file, but we don't actually take full database snapshots in here. We just store the wall. So in your case, when we have a page that's very heavily updated, we will store all the wall entries that contain the modifications, but not the actual, like you know, page, uh, full page image. And those small modifications are tiny. Right, yes, they will be scattered. Uh, you are not going yes. to reorder them and write them uh, for every page. It, it will be just a regular wall. Yeah, so some of them will be in this file, some of them will be in this one, and some will be, will be here, yeah. right? So yeah. My, another question. So we have uh, like a page that is changed, let's say, every second. So for if you want to go travel back in time for one hour, you will have 300, yes. 3600 uh, those. 
scattered all over your storage. Yes, to repeat the question. Under this primitive model, yes. Let me repeat the question. So if we have a lot of updates to a single page, we have a very hot page, all this wall is going to be scattered uh, across many different files. So how do we deal with that? Do we want to read all of those files? No, like this page server needs to answer in microseconds, not hours. Uh, <laughs> so the first thing we do is we vertically partition these files. So if horizontally, if we have time and vertical, we have page number. Right. So when we accumulate enough deltas, let's say like three deltas in a row, we're going to take those deltas, repartition them by key space, uh, so that the so that we'd have like on the left, um, so that uh, wall entries that are closer to each other in page space end up actually in the closer to each other on disk. Uh, currently, one thing that we do is, if you have three delta files, right, and they're, the domain of all of these delta files initially is, they span the entire key range, but they, they span different time ranges, right, initially. So you have, the first delta file is deltas on any page in the past, and then deltas on any page after those writes, and then the next delta files contain, contains, uh, again, pages on the entire, wall entries uh, on the entire page domain, which are, um, which happen after the latest. So we take all of these, uh, we combine the wall entries from all of these uh, delta pages and repartition them by page. So that now we get three delta files where the first one uh, is about pages that are to the, you know, like in the first third of the key space. The second delta file uh, contains updates on the second third of the key space. So you group them not by page ID, but by some uh, range of pages? Yeah, we convert these. Like this timeline is very vertical. We slowly make it more horizontal as time goes on. Essentially, reordering the group them by page. Yes, uh, by page intervals. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing that increases the locality, right? Uh, but it doesn't completely solve the problem. This helps us with if we want to uh, take the entire key space and if we want to shard it and reassign part of that to a different page server. This kind of vertical partitioning allows us to do stuff like that. Also allows us to. You know, when you spin up your database and let's say page server is dead, you want to uh, recover your page server as fast as possible, you don't need to recover the entire key space. You can start from the key space that's relevant first and then do the rest. So this kind of vertical partition also helps with that. But it's not the entire story. There's also caching. Uh, so there are a lot of caching heuristics that are actually in the works, like my on Monday morning, I was planning to work on exactly this, and then the CEO called me and said, I have COVID. Uh, do you have plans for on Wednesday? Can you, <laughs> can you uh, get a plane ticket and present on this? So I'm presenting on this. But yeah, so, so one other thing you can do is like when you have a page that's very hot, uh, every once in a while, take page images and store those in your cache so that, you know, when you get a reconstru page reconstruction request, what you need to do is find the latest image of that page, find all the wall after that, redo it. And if you have a lot of these images, then chances are uh, in your page cache as opposed to these uh, persisted files, right? Like we have a separate ephemeral page cache that is not stored in cold storage anywhere. So if your page is there, you're going to start with an image that's very close to what you have, and then you're going to apply just a little bit of wall. Yes. Uh, or you'll have to accumulate a lot of deltas, and if those deltas are spread across the disk, you 
would have to read each delta separately. Yes. Yeah, so if you go with the first approach that you said, which is take frequent page images, like let's say after one, pages are eight kilobytes, right? So if you say after eight kilobytes of wall, I'm gonna take an image so that my space is roughly 50% uh, consists of just page images, then that means that you double your write amplification, but now the maximum amount of wall you will ever have to replace eight kilobytes because every eight kilobytes of wall you have an image. That's not the approach we have, that's one approach we could take. Another approach is to recognize that this page server, even though it answers queries for the, it answers time travel queries, right? Like get page at any time, still uh, most, the vast majority of those are gonna be about the latest page and optimizing the latest page performance is a lot easier than optimizing arbitrary because we can have a latest page cache. Uh, yeah, it's a big design space we have to explore, right? Like uh, a lot of uh, pros and cons to consider. Great question. This is exactly my job. <laughs> uh, who do you work for, by the way? Uh, that's the name of the company? No, no. Uh, I, you asked what, what I work yeah. for. Huawei. Huawei, okay, nice. Yeah, let's chat later. Um, um, any other questions? Let me go back here so we have the links. Uh, the cloud service is open source too. Okay, I'll open source. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Including our release timelines and issue tracking and um, RFCs and all of that is on GitHub. Yes, we're, we're thinking about it, about to start on that. So what is the baseline that you would get when you have a new instance? The baseline might say over here, let me check. Um, let me go back to my link. Does one vCPU <laughs> answer your question good enough or something more? Okay. Yes, we are targeting so individual developers. So that we can developers. Yeah, initially we're targeting individual developers because we want to integrate with the community as much as possible. The existing Postgres community, grow it a little bit in the cloud direction, have our own community. Yeah, it just came out last week, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know all the details. They're doing something very similar, right? Uh, but obviously, they're not going to be multi cloud, probably. And they're going to be Google. And uh, they're already enterprise focused. There are some differences to consider. And you are focusing on which segment of the market? Uh, mid market and individual developers. Yeah, I looked on Twitter and people are already asking them, why didn't you just contribute to this open source version <laughs> instead of starting this? And the answer is they started a lot earlier than us. Uh, so is everything you're offering available in open source in, in your repo? Uh, like, yes, everything that we were offering is open source. Is that? The, uh, the entire like, storage stack, everything. We would like to play with this on our own on-prem. Yes. Uh, first, you can try playing with it 
compile the uh, compile the uh, code base and play with it locally. We have a local CLI that I can demo if people are interested. I can demo branches in there and and time travel queries. Uh, let me just tell you how to do that because it's pretty simple. You go to the GitHub page I linked, and you're gonna get instructions on how to run the local installation. Play with this. So if this tests really well, do you plan to offer support contracts for people who run it on prem? Uh, that's. I'm probably not the best person to answer that. <laughs> Yeah, if there are no more questions in the next seven seconds, we use this seven second rule to figure out if there is, if it should come to an end. Then I'll just hang out here and you can talk to me if you want, but we should end it. All right, thank you all.